and welcome to another episode of Death Drive Dialectics. I'm Tyler Moraz here with Nick Tolliver, and today we have the pleasure of speaking with Alenka Zupanchik. Alenka Zupanchik is a philosopher and psychoanalytic theorist. She's also a researcher at the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts and a professor at the European Graduate School. Zupanchik is also a member of the Ljubljana School of Psychoanalysis, alongside other famous Slovenian philosophers, such as Slavoj Žižek, whom we had a great conversation with this past summer. Uh, your Lacanian scholarship in particular has been most influential in the development of uh, our channel, Death Drive Dialectics, and our own theoretical trajectories. But uh, we are a YouTube channel dedicated to making philosophy, psychoanalysis, and leftist theory fun and accessible. And last year, we made a video based on your book, Ethics of the Real, uh, using Batman and the Joker, two most uh, well-known superhero and villain, to help us understand the relationship between Kant and Saad. So we are very excited and deeply honored to have you here on our channel and, and welcome. Thank you very much. I'm also deeply honored to be here. Thank you. Uh, so we, um, in preparation for the interview, read your book, uh, What is Sex? And I wanted to ask you the question from the title, what is sex and what is sexuation? Uh, as, uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, the the, uh, the way this title works, at least for me, is not that uh, here is the question and then the book is the answer. Uh, the idea is that uh, this question form, in a way, is the answer. That is to say precisely that what is sex is the real question. And it's not uh, simply uh, because, okay, I start by dismissing this idea that we often have uh, that, of course, we all know what sex is. I mean, of course, we all know what it is, but I kind of argue that this is not so sure. Or if, you know, in a way, you can say, okay, you can always say if something is sexual or feel it or whatever. But then if you are asked to define what exactly is sexual in what you perceive as sexual, then problems start. Uh, is it this? Is it this? so? It's something. Uh, this for me was the kind of guiding question of this, let's say, ontological interrogation to the question of sexuality that I uh, did. Uh, that kind of guided my uh, research in this book, uh, and which precisely led me to this kind of uh, conclusions that sexuality is not uh, something like an entity or a being or a substance that we could uh, isolate and define and then say okay so now this is uh, uh, this is sex uh, uh, and that it also involves a really large uh, realm of phenomena uh, where the boundaries are often blurred i mean it's uh, there is multiplicity there is also this kind of blurring of the boundaries what it, it does it start here on the sec or a second later or where it is it exactly so um but uh and my kind of answer was that this problem this difficulty of saying what exactly is a sex is not simply related to this multiplicity and uh, uh, elusiveness of boundaries but perhaps more Precisely to this fact that I already mentioned that it is not a substance or a being, but like, like more like a kind of uh, articulation or form of a certain contradiction, antagonism of our being, of our substance, of our social being, of our like subjective individual being, and so on. So that it is a name of this uh, contradiction of this uh, antagonism and and not simply uh, of uh, of some being. So this would be a very kind of um, rough sketch of uh, yeah, or, yeah. Of a possible uh, answer to the question what is uh, what is sex yeah uh, but you also said sexuation yeah okay sexuation for me this simply means kind of um, subjective response or subjective more like not really response but subjective uh, appropriation of this antagonism, of this contradiction. That is to say, we subjectivize it and this is how we become this or that subject. So it's not simply how we subjectively respond to this, but there is something that is constitutive even of subjectivity uh, um, as, and then rela that relates precisely to this contradiction, to this uh, antagonism to which we respond and 
become subject uh, or not or whatever in yeah. the uh, in in this the, sense the, the internalization of the sort of constitutive negativity that is um, Sex. But not uh, yes, but not simply internalization in the sense. Okay, now uh, it's also you make something of it. You make a certain kind of uh, dialectics uh, of being or whatever. It, uh, I don't like the term identity so much, and we'll probably go into this as well. But it is not simply that you internalize it, like we say you internalize guilt or this or that, but that um, you transform it subjectively into something uh, that is part of your, let's say, uh, um, toolbox of being. <laughs> and it's so it's not, and you also, can, so it's something that really becomes uh, not simply part of you or something that you deal with, but also that informs and in the way you respond to it, reforms all, all the way through your existence, uh, also the way you position yourself, what you say, how you say, it, and not like colors them, but kind of um, is part of decisions that, that you make or not. Yeah, I I, I, pre I especially appreciated the way you uh, discuss the title of the book, not as a question to be answered, but simply as posing sex as a question itself, something that you're sort of always answering as you're going throughout life, as you're saying, or, or a toolbox, but in the form of a uh, something that simply doesn't sit uh, in a, in a yeah, static that way. You have to invent, uh, actually, and it's not simply that you find it and say, okay, this is now uh, me. You you have to go through it. You, 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 there is, uh, you can be helped by some things, but actually, you, it ha in a way, it has to uh, come from you as the very negativity that that is yours, not simply um, uh, something else. Yeah, sorry. No, yeah. Mm, yeah, and I, I think we wanted perhaps another pretty fundamental question. Uh, I think the most common understanding of sex is at the same time a confusion between sex and gender. And if you can maybe outline the the how people most likely or most generally understand gender and how it relates to sex and exactly how Lacan how yourself would would maybe separate those those two things or or explain how one comes from the other. Yeah, yeah, you are very right. This is kind of um, uh, thing to be discussed and to be also kind of. Uh, uh, perhaps put into a certain perspective, because it is true that, uh, uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, okay, th there is this general uh, difference between what is called today gender theory and psychoanalysis, pre at least in its, let's say, Lacanian vein, uh, which is that uh, gender theory today mostly works with the issue of identity. Um, and the way the latter is then constructed um, and also how these constructions should be counteracted and uh, met with different kind of constructions and so on. Uh, so it is um, largely moving in the realm, let's say, of a certain identity. Even if these identities are multiple and very, very, very numerous, uh, still there are, there are function as some kind of identities. And um, whereas uh, uh, for me, the way I understand um, uh, Lacan and psychoanalysis is precisely that sex and sexuations, uh, sexuation are kind of, a, um, so through these terms, one preserves a certain inherent uh, dynamics, also a certain inherent negativity that informs all these uh, movements and also the, the the idea that there is something intrinsically uh, disruptive of identity that pertains to sex and sexuality, not something, simply something that could uh, uh, serve as a kind of uh, basis of identity. Uh, and so in this kind of, let's say, general perspective, there is also this kind of now, if I put it philosophically, between gender studies and the kind of Lacanian psychoanalysis that I suppose I'm doing, uh, there is this difference that philosophically could be described very often as the difference between nominalism. So these are just names that we 
work with and that uh, uh, and uh, what it was traditionally philosophical realism so that there is something outside these names but then the whole question today i guess is precisely how to reinvent realism in terms which are different than simply, you know, correspondent with some objects in in reality. So, uh, uh, but uh, and perhaps perhaps it is worth uh, pointing out also that, for instance, when uh, Judith Butler came around with this, started uh, developing and uh, proposing this. Um, what is now called her gender theory and so on, gender trouble and so on. Actually, it was. Uh, it started as a, a utterly anti-identitarian project. It's, this has changed a lot through the way this uh, was then, whatever, read, appropriated, and so on. But I think the, the first trust for her, it was actually precisely to kind of use gender to counteract what was seen in many, many, in general, let's say, uh, understanding as a kind of uh, uh, sexual essentialism uh, of uh, or essentialism of uh, sex as based on anatomy on biology and so on and so this was a kind of a counter uh, acting uh, this with the idea of the of gender, the, the, the real of sex is not in, let's say, in anatomy. Of course, I mean, psychoanalysis did not really claim that uh, anatomy was uh, uh, the key here, at least uh, not um, in its mo most uh, interesting veins. Uh, but yeah, but then, uh, of course, the, the way it, the, the whole gender theory developed, at least I'm simplifying it a little bit, but the way it developed, it it was that it moved more and more into this issue of how we should counteract this normative repression of certain forms of being by uh, other identities, by kind of inventing, so to say, or constructing this identity. So the, the whole um, question shifted uh, rather quickly or massively into this question of identity politics or politics as uh, identity politics and so on. And I think this is, uh, whereas uh, psychoanalysis uh, for me again, uh, is something that kept trying to kind of reinvent the ontological realism of the sexual beyond uh, precisely the question of anatomy and this kind of uh, nature uh, determining uh, our sexuality, but uh, without going, simply dismissing any real as part of this uh, uh, dynamics, as part of this, uh, um, yeah, these dialectics and so on. Um, so, um, yeah. You mentioned the, the real there in part of your answer, and Lacanians have a, a very particular understanding of the real. Um, how does the real figure into sex and into sexuality? Yeah, and how... Uh, maybe a more a basic version of how how exactly does it differ from reality as perhaps most people would understand it so what is what is that how would you make that distinct from from reality yeah yeah i think this is a really important distinction that psychoanalysis makes again a very uh, tricky difficult uh, distinction which is sometimes confused with uh, something like there is reality and then there is real as the real reality or the true reality beyond the, re the this illusionary reality that uh, that we are living in and so on. But I don't think this is the point of this notion of the real. So sometimes it's also understood as some kind of a uh, uh, muddy primeral substance uh, to which uh, out of which that we then uh, embellish or make something else of it and so on. So uh, I, I really don't think so. I think this um, um, relationship between the real and the reality needs to be understood in terms precisely of their um, internal or that they are part of the same reality in a way, but in in a way uh, that is not, that they are not at the same time reducible to each other. Or you could put it like this, the real, the existence of real, of real is precisely a way of saying 
that reality is not entirely kind of reducible back to itself, that it produces more or less that it produces and so on, that it is written by contradictions that you not necessarily see like uh, directly, but that are there uh, and orchestrate the kind of uh, what we see and what we don't see, what is possible and what is impossible and so on. So one way of putting it would also be to say that uh, um, real is the the piece or the dimension of reality that needs to be kind of excluded for that reality to appear as consistent, as readable, as something that makes sense. Because very often when we say that there is some, some kind of intrusion of the real or appearance of the real is precisely that it, it appears as something that uh, shocks us or surprises us, disorients us, all of a sudden we are no longer sure um, of, uh, we, we lose some of the repairs of our reality that we are used to and familiar with. So there, but this is not to say that uh, real is uh, placed somewhere else than reality and then from time to time jumps <laughs> or intervenes in this reality. Uh, it is, uh, there are one in the, there are it is part yeah. of reality precisely as uh, it's inherent also a problem, antagonism, division, and so on. So it's a, and sometimes it makes itself felt and present in a very, uh, in a way which can no longer be neglected, uh, whereas otherwise it's just the other side of or, uh, of the same reality that we are think that we know, and it's so. Uh, there is a certain relationship between the two, which is not simply, and the real, even though like early Lacan was toying with this idea that it is beyond the symbolic, uh, but then more and more um, he came to theorize it as precisely as this kind of inherent impasse of the symbolic. And then of course, there is the famous saying that uh, uh, real is the impossible, and this is very, I think a very good and uh, important way of putting it. But as I add, I think in the ethics of the real or whatever, one of the books, um, it, this does not mean that uh, real is something impossible to happen. So that, that, that there is the impossible, there is always something which is impossible and we chase after this or whatever, but it is impossible. Uh, no, it is precise, it is impossible because it happens. As impossible, the impossible happens, and this is what is offered shattering about the real, in good or not necessarily even just in tragic sense or traumatic sense. It could also, could, also, could be a kind of a um, good surprise, but nevertheless, it is, and it's even if we expect it, it still surprises us. There is something at a certain dimension of uh, um, surprise, which is also irreducible when we talk about um, about the real. So. Anyway, there are many ways in which, but it's important for me, uh, and I think for general kind of theoretical, philosophical landscape of contemporary uh, theory to, to precisely uh, try to maintain this difference without reducing it into some kind of uh, whatever, more or less relig religious terms of the phenomena and then something beyond them, which is the true real whatever. It's mm -hmm. not this kind of relationship. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, bring it back uh, the now the real relationship to uh, gender and sex. And, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in your book, you had sort of made that relationship clear in the sense that gender uh, or the real is sort of this trans historical negativity, right? That is beyond the symbolic, as, as you just said, and and gender as this highly symbolic practice or, or uh, is Judith Butler would say performance, uh, would it be the case that gender is sort of a response or a veiling of that of that lack, like a, a sort of um, uh, a way of not disavowing the lack, but simply circulating around it uh, through or, or a, a way of attempting to to uh, to cover it up in, in a certain way and not to the to discount gender as, a, as an actual and legitimate uh, activity, but just as a way of understanding how gender relates to this constitutive negativity, you know. It, yeah, I think first I would like just because I'm not sure from your question that I made myself clear when I uh, when I said that uh, I wanted to say precisely that the real should not be 
uh, understood as something beyond the symbolic, mm. but as precisely the something that introduces this negativity, the, the, the concept of negativity into the symbolic itself, not simply negativity, but also this kind of disruptive, that something the real is inherent to the symbolic as its disruptive moment, as the, 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 the point of it, um, its inherent the impossibility. So, and here, yeah, I think at least this is my, the, also the theory that I developed in the book. I think that uh, it, the the term, the concept of uh, of sex, of sexuality, uh, kind of, if you read it through psychoanalysis and through all these dimensions also, of the unconscious and so on, preserves this negativity, preserves this um, disruptive thing uh, as inherent to the symbolic, and not, but not simply symbolic. This is a something within symbolic which is not symbolic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, at least again, this is my uh, criticism or whatever take on it. The gender, the, the way the the term functions, um, is in a kind of entirely, let's say, positive way. In the sense of you name a certain. Uh, identity or symbol it is um the symbolic is kind of in it reduced back to pure symbolic and it loses precisely this kind of uh disruptive thing uh that uh, the symbolic itself cannot completely mm, cover or tackle it so uh, uh I, I kind of it kind of separates the negativity from uh what uh from the way in which the symbolic struggles with it or attempts to kind of accommodate it and so and so on. So uh, the emphasis is definitely primarily on the symbolic, on how we on the symbolic causality, on how we act through the symbolic, also through performative gestures uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, it, on the other side, I think what is, for me at least, interesting in this uh, term of, of sexuality, which obviously also involves uh, or is even kind of synonymous with concepts such as desire, uh, not only drive, but also desire, which again is a way how we relate not only intersubjectively, but also broadly with the uh, world. With some, I mean, it is desire, I think it's another important uh, concept that I'm working on a lot lately and it's uh, clearly related it's one way of saying sexuality and again if you look at the question very often i'm not so say this is uh, always the case but uh, the whole uh, gender theory very often it, uh, it it leaves out the question of desire as something uh, which again is not so i think it's a crucial thing and a crucial thing to um to analyze also to to see how its own how the, the, to to follow to pursue the contradictions that the desires that we have um, uh, confront us with and so on. So it's um, yeah, I'm not sure if this uh, you can retract yeah. your question if I got uh, uh, there's, too there's far from the in what you said that that um, I wanted to kind of pick up on it the the disruptive element within the symbolic as the real. Um, the way yeah, in which yeah. the symbolic is in contradiction with itself. And I, I am, it makes me think about um, non-binary and transgender identities and the ways in which that sort of is an impossible within the sort of structure of binary gender. And I was wondering if, how you understood sexuation as informing non-binary and trans sort of um, existence. Yeah. Uh... Well, I think, um, first of all, I mean, okay, this is um, difficult, perhaps, um, without entering into uh, this kind of sophisticated Lacanian uh, debates, but you know, the, 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 the kind of fundamental thesis of Lacanian sexual let's say, theory, uh, or theory of sexuation is precisely there is no binary signifier. This is the kind of <laughs> uh, gospel of, uh, so uh, this, Binary, I mean, uh, the way psychoanalysis uh, uh, uses or posits or uh, views this question of binarism is a very specific one. So uh, the, the idea is, in fact, there is no uh, 
uh, binary signifier in and in this sense um, um, the the situation that, that follows from it, uh, it's precisely something that springs, let's say, from this real, from this, uh, from this select, from this kind of. Uh, otherwise, we would have uh, uh, the kind of more or less. Uh, complementary or supplementary or symmetrical way of coupling or be it uh, through uh, across the same sex on another it's that it, but it would make a very different sexual landscape from the one that we are kind of um, used to or that we are kind of historically were able to see uh, so it's uh, this is um, the, the the question and it's an ongoing debate it is not and i i really don't think that one can uh, that this to say that uh, this binarism is now this kind of slim word you know it's a kind of you say binarism in bow bow but uh, uh, first of all i would say uh, to even if you say this is something bad it's, these are bad oppositions uh, and it's then it's difficult to apply them in this case because as i said there is no yin yang or, or of feminine and masculine principle in the kenyan theory um, then secondary, if, even if you say, okay, binarism is bad, let's let's counteract it with uh, multiplicity. But what is multiplicity? I mean, philosophically, ontologically speaking, uh, actually, it is something that, to put it very simply, uh, is uh, this multiplicity is always multiplicity of ones. Let's say of uh, uh, okay. Th then there. Are, there is the Bedouian theory, which constructs multiplicity in a different way, but precisely that which has nothing to do with this kind of gender multiplicity uh, theory. So, but usually it is kind of multiplicity of ones. So, uh, but what you get there, it is not that you go you you your way out of of the binary is to be reduced actually to the incessant repetition of one and the same logic, and this is for me. Something okay, this one and this one is different, and then we have a different one, but they are ontologically constituted as these ones that are then uh, part of this uh, landscape. And for me, a crucial claim that Lacan makes when he uh, also in his theory of sexuation, sexual difference, is precisely this how do we get from one to the other, which is really other, which is not just another one. And this is the for him, I guess, the the the, the key also conceptual, philosophical, mathematical question. It is not enough to add another one that now this is the other. This is then the replica or some kind of uh, imaginary. So uh, how to get out of this logic of the one and its multiplication ad infinitum. And so the concept of the other, also including the other sex, corresponds to this conceptual effort of thinking the other precisely in different terms from this oneness, multiplicity, and so on. So to, to, to think it through a difference, which is not a difference between this one and that one, but a kind of difference that divides as from within, I mean, it's only one. There is only one difference that is then repeated, but then it is. Uh, so like I the, think this the, the different difference, right? Like the not. Yeah, the difference that yeah also that makes a difference, so to say. It's not because uh, we have uh, and even Deleuze, who is not exactly a Lacanian, but he has this insistence in difference in repetition precisely between the at stake here is not simply difference between uh, uh, this multiplicity uh, can only be the form of difference, ne not uh, something that's, uh, that that um, introduces us to this multiplicity of differences. Of, um, so, uh, like. But again, these are kind of very serious philosophical, ontological questions that, but at the same time, that appear within psychoanalysis and even within the clinic. I'm not a clinician, but that so so much I know, as uh, also something that is very um, concretely at stake for for all of us. So even if it sounds some kind of a, um, abstract metaphysics, and this is also 
part of why, for Lacan, if you read his theory of sexuation, of blah, blah, blah this is uh, high mathematics. It reads like high mathematics. It doesn't read like uh, this kind of direct, uh, everyday experience. There is something metaphysical in this, uh, but it's like because uh, the, the, the thing itself behaves in this kind of metaphysical way, not simply because we make something um, out of it. Uh, so mm-hmm. I don't know if this uh, uh, I said the, you just reiterate if I let something important out uh, and was there in your question, please. Yeah, no, I think I think that was a, a good explanation or a a, a clarification of exactly uh, the, the difference between perhaps a more dialectical understanding of difference and versus a one of of multiplicity um, and. And how how that like like Nick, Nick said and how you were saying this this different difference that yeah, isn't just yeah. foundational but is repeated within each uh, sort of entity right uh, it, it's not yeah, yeah. Um, and just to 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 emphasize once more what because I really think uh, this goes back to this question of. Um, uh, relationship or is psychoanalysis something uh, that uh, kind of um, condemns us to this binary logic? Again, I would repeat what I said in relationship to this uh, difference that Lacan uh, tries to establish between one and the other, not as some kind of, but precisely that you cannot um, have this kind of, I mean, binary is here, uh, not some Two elements then that uh, exist and kind of combine and uh, complement each other, but what looks like binary, I don't really think this is binary logic in any sense, but there are two elements, there is something and then there is something different. <laughs> there is something, and this something like that different be like a, a non- can be itself a field of multiplicity, but it's not uh, just because you say there is there is one and there is another, you can say, okay, there is a third one, you can feel it's not the same. I mean, you are already Past this, so I think it is very important to establish uh, this kind of um, uh, difference, which is precisely um, one, and this is what gives us the impression that so necessarily we have two sides. But this is not the, exactly the uh, the point. Mm-hmm. To me, it strikes me like a Lacanian theory is a, a non-binary theory of sex itself. That you know the difference between a binary on one uh, hand. Yeah. The other on the other of the non-binary, the you know, the. I the... think this is a good way of uh, of putting it precisely. Yeah, it is uh, because it works with this kind of um, um, fundamental asymmetry, which is foreign to what is usually the binary logic of these simple oppositions. Uh, and I'm not saying. I mean, sometimes even simple oppositions can be interesting, or but but it's not. Uh, uh, not, not particularly my piece of cake, uh, but it, in a way, precisely, it is something that is not uh, pre- that works with this that moves precisely this difference in a way that is much more interesting than um, uh, this fixation with uh, yeah uh, complementary binary whatever positions you need. There is no this without this. There is no this without that, and so on. Yeah, yeah, I think. Uh the way you described sex uh, or or this difference is and Lacan's explanation of it is is highly metaphysical or, or mathematical uh I think two of his very famous aphorisms you know come to mind and, and I'm sure if we go through it we can further clarify uh but them being the woman does not exist the woman does not exist and there is no sexual relationship so if you could briefly kind of go over what these mean uh, can we take yeah. him literally, or perhaps is it a, a poor articulation, or does he mean exactly that, like the woman does not exist? Yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, this has already been you know, interpreted many times. So, uh, um, of course, the the term it's not simply that it's meant as a provocation, but precisely the wording is important. The woman. So this is simply relatable to what we were discussing saying what I was saying before, um, there is no binary signifier. 
if there were, like to say, we, we would say the woman is the binary signifier, it, it, it exists. Um, uh, this does not mean that women are not, <laughs> do not exist or that, uh, that they are not around, but precisely that uh, they are kind of, uh, they are, or whatever is, there is always this kind of uh, circularity. What defines women is precisely that they, in a way, as women, that in a way, they are, uh, follow a different logic than the, the, the logic of the one, of the oneness. And one is what exists through oneness, is one exists through. Is, so it is, this does not say in, in, in the symbolic, huh? precisely because there, there is um, here to some extent, I mean, it's not that uh, Lacan is on the completely opposite pole from the, from, from Butler or from the, uh, the, the mm -hmm. existence in a way is symbolic existence that can be symbolically constructed. But this is not to say that there is nothing else that is there uh, and women are obviously there but so the, the, this whole play on the word this kind of provocative statement uh, women does not exist is another way of saying uh, the other is not the other one there is no binary signifier the, the other or another yet another expression the other is not all or not all again this does not mean that it lacks something, but that even that it has, that it includes its own ex exception, its own lack. I mean, the, there are many, many ways in which one could reiterate and read together uh, all these uh, strange claims, uh, because uh, very often also the, the this association of um, uh, women is uh, women is uh, not all or not whole. It's again a kind of a um, reference to something that is. Uh, supposedly missing there, uh, whereas the Lacan's point in this lo logical formulas is precisely that um, differently to the male side, which is actually based on a const constitutive exception, there is one which is not this, so all of them, the universality becomes, concludes itself as all based on this exception, on this exclusion, when there, on this other side, we have no exception, we have no exclusion. So it, the exclusion itself to the rule is part of it. So it's, uh, in this sense, it's not, not all, it doesn't constitute a one, it doesn't constitute the other sex in this, uh, uh, in this sense. So uh, does this make it any clearer? I mean, this first... Uh, question uh, what yeah. does it mean and then the the, the second one um okay there is no uh, sexual uh, relation um uh, of course i i guess again here this is this a very interesting way in which um uh, lacan um, expresses uh, the same fact namely that men and women let's to, to use this wording, are not binary couple, couples. Uh, they get together, for they obviously do get together, um, uh, and form relationships across something that actually excludes any complementarity or symmetry or some other predetermined logic of this coupling, or even hier hierarchy or whatever. But it, uh, so it, this is precise, there is no sexual relation, uh, but the relations that we have uh, between men and women, between men, between women, between whatever, are absolutely uh, relay, all related uh, to precisely this real, which in this case is the absence of uh, this kind of, uh, as Lorenzo Chiesa would say, that this kind of key, the, the key lock that, that would unlock the key of, or make it a simple um, question of uh, of fitting, of coupling, uh, of supplementing each other and so on. Uh, so, um, but uh, the, this is important for me also to stress that I don't read this statement. I, again, I read it as a kind of philosophical, logical also, as well as kind of uh, a phenomenological statement, which is not to say, okay, oh, there is no rule and no nothing like this. So this is why we have such a shitty, whatever, sex life or relationships and so on. Uh, uh, it, it is not a kind of uh, uh, lament of anything. It is kind of very logical description of the way in which we do form relationships. We do 
love each other, we do desire each other, uh, but that this is all, as I said earlier, done across something that precisely prevents this to be a kind of immediate relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, something that works more or less uh, automatically or uh, comes with any kind of guarantee of uh, or recipe of now we have to, I mean, you have all these kind of books that then tell you, yeah, but if you behave like this, then you will be happier with it. But this is precisely something that or like you know, the, the interest of our uh, relationships is also that we kind of uh, uh, invent our form of sexual relationship or how we make the non-relationship work in a way that is um, um, kind of uh, rewarding like for us and good for us rather than uh, simply or but it could also be de destructive of course destruction can be a way of coping with this i mean these, these are all kinds of ways in which this could work i mean it's, it's like a fundamental incongruity uh, between people that that we are you know that we can't be no. made congruous this and this reminds me of Lacan's other quote I, I can't say it exactly but it's like I love you but I love something that's either more within you or that's not that's not uh, no. in you yeah uh, uh, this is yeah this is one way in which he formulates this kind of um, asymmetry again between what he formulates as sexual positions uh, because this uh, something in you more than you is what is otherwise famously called the uh, object other this object small a which is uh, what makes you at the same time what makes you so precious so exceptional so something that's uh, uh, for which i desire you but also something that can lead to this kind of attitude in which i kind of think of you as nothing more as the envelope of this precious object and kind of treat you accordingly. That is to say, mistreat you. So I mutilate you because there is something so that the, the, the way in which a desire relates not simply to the totality, whatever, of our uh, personality, but to a kind of can relate to a very singular thing, trait uh, that uh, the, and we are actually in a relationship with that as well, not only with uh, mm. with uh, the other as this kind of uh, imaginary, whatever, uh, bodily presence. But then, of course, then there, there, there is the whole trick and dynamics of the desire and love, how the, 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 uh, the two can work together precisely in a way that perhaps is not... Uh, uh, that goes not so much in this way of uh, distracting you because you there is something in you that I love even more than you, but uh, as a kind of a different part of the, in which I uh, take the the other uh, as the envelope of this object as something that um, makes me uh, in a good way uh, makes me uh, laugh and enjoy the relationship rather than something that needs to, that I want to destroy and just preserve this, you know, uh, one thing that is, uh, is there. This is what, what I read and this I develop more um, extensively in the book on comedy, precisely with this idea of love as comedy. And so when, because Lacan says at some point that love is actually a comic feeling, which also again be, can be, can sound counterintuitively oh, but is now is love not all about tragedy and passion and uh, but but uh, he kind of very nicely brings out this question that in a way it is a comic feeling and in a good way i mean this is not to make fun of love or saying that this is not serious on the on the opposite mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, a very good answer to those to those two af aphorisms. Uh, something that Nick and I have been uh, have speculated a lot on as we've been reading through your book is the question as to whether these statements and Lacan's uh, theory of sexuation at large, uh, whether they're universal or transhistorical. And because uh, as we know, Lacan was speaking within a very specific context uh, you know, like Western 1950s in, in, in France. And so we were constantly thinking to uh, to non-Western contexts uh, and perhaps more, for lack of a better term, tribal contexts in which uh, maybe it's not uh, perhaps a matriarchal. So 
in one sense, is it possible in another society or culture to say that the man does not exist or does that, or, or is, is that, uh, that non-relation uh, carried through as long as there's a symbolic, you know? Yeah, no, these are uh, great questions, very important, and but also that would need a really, really, I mean, quite some time to 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 explore, you know, um, their facets. Uh, I think that first of all, as to this question of what is it trans, let's say, trans historic psychoanalysis. I think this is a very uh, difficult question because I don't think that there is simply something uh, transhistoric in the sense of some kind of um, eternal nature of uh, of men or of humanity or of women that is uh, uh, at stake here. Uh, but precisely this kind of, perhaps I could put it this way, the a historical core of the history itself, in the sense that it's not something uh, beyond that remains unchanged all through history, uh, but that is kind of involved precisely uh, uh, as it's real in all different historical changes, which are not simply, which are again historical, like we said of reality, but not simply reducible to history or produ production of history. So the, the history itself of, uh, at least of, uh, of, the, of humanity, of social relations, uh, also tackles with this uh, eternal core, which again is not eternal in the sense that it exists uh, beyond all, uh, cultural, historical, social forms of, of society, but precisely as something which is, again, almost reinvented as the impossibility, as the real, with each and every of them. So, uh, uh, again, so and I think this is important to stress because uh, I, I, at least myself, and I guess most of psychoanalysts, are not uh, in this kind of uh, ideas of some kind of uh, transcendental principles of uh, be it femininity, masculinity, or whatever, and then, or some real, which, which is, no, it, I, I, I think I, again, see it as at the same, as an inherent uh, historical core of history itself. And there is no history uh, outside of this core or without this, uh, this kind of uh, core. And it, it changed, the, the core, uh, this uh, historical core kind of changes itself through history, but not, uh, but precisely in the way it uh, forms and informs uh, whatever the historical things. And then, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this is this was a long um, uh, answer to just one of uh, of the things that you said at the beginning. But then, please remind me, uh, you went on to say or suggest, uh, yeah, the, the, other potential contexts in which uh, uh, this... so if this, yeah, uh, if this is. Uh, uh, like uh, you mean like cultural context or uh, yeah huh, the question of uh, whether we could say um there is no uh, i mean the, the man does not exist so i guess uh, i mean here again there is this question of do you define man by uh, i mean uh, in a way you know from this uh, from this theoretical perspective it is not that you have men and women and then some this exists and this not. It is uh, it is rather the other way around. The beings that uh, identify themselves uh, as ones, as one signifier, are called in this Lacanian algebra men. It is not that they have something that women don't have. They they simply uh, uh, invent themselves as subjectivity or emerge as subjectivity through a certain way in which they relate to uh, th this kind of one signifier. And I will perhaps try to explain why it is one and why is it called like it is, which is uh, the signifier of sexuality or of desire for everybody, not just for men. So, and obviously I am talking about the famous, unfamous uh, phallus, which is a uh, very interesting entity in psychoanalysis, because as you know, Freud introduced it through this um, direct anatomical difference. So, and then the, there is the whole, you know, question of, okay, so half of humanity does not have this organ, so what uh, they were. And I think what Lacan made of it is a 
extremely, extremely interesting, not what he made of it, but what he saw that Freud was saying is that it is the, the, the question why this became, the, why for Lacan it became a signifier in the kind of privileged um, signifier of, the, of sexuation. Uh, it's not, uh, it's precisely the, the fact that half, let's say roughly, half of human beings don't have it. It is because it could not be there because it as such then starts to evoke its own absence, something which is not, which is there contingently, not necessarily, something that emerges as signifier precisely because uh, of its possible absence and not because of its physical presence. It is this idea that, uh, uh, and this is for why Lacan is a signifier of castration or for the minus and so on, not of some full physical potency or whatever. It is precisely based on this negativity that, that is there that accompanies it from the outset as precisely something that can not be there, and the fact that it is there is completely contingent, you didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it or whatever, is something that uh, actually uh, makes it possible to function as a signifier, as Lacan puts it, of the lack uh, as such. And this is a signifier that sexes refer to, or um, again, we could say subjectivize in a different way. Well, and very, very simple way of putting uh, or reformulating how uh, psychoanalysis sees this is to say, okay, one, pretend that they have it, and we usually call them men, but as you probably know from experience, there are many women, and, uh, I mean like biological women, who also pretend to have it. And I'm not saying like, but, you know, people who act, women, yeah. men, who act as they lack nothing, that they are mm -hmm. fully sustainable, self-sustainable, so to say, that they lack nothing, they have it. And I'm not, again, talking at all about something like what we used to call masculine women or whatever, or phallic women. No, no, they are they extremely feminine appearances, which... All, nevertheless suggest that they uh, they have it and you better shut down because they have it. Okay, and then there is that another way. way. Yeah, that sorry. way it sounds very connected to power. The the phallus is sort of this. Of course, because to have it, it, to have to have this nothing, you appropriate the nothing as something, a signifier that you have and you can do very powerful things with them, precisely because as a signifier, it becomes something, uh, it, it, the, the, uh, as Lacan very in interestingly formulated, it is a maneuver in which the impotence or impuissance uh, becomes impossibility. And impossibility is a symbolic term also, and you can use it as a weapon in a way. You can use it uh, also as a source of, of power. Yeah, and in this sense, the, 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 there are these relationships. And then of course, it's not simply, also power can function in different ways and not necessarily or simply in this kind of Phallicized, phallic ways there. Uh, but okay, I just wanted to uh, to complete this other part of uh, what I was saying that there is also this difference of uh, instead of having it, being it, not simply being the phallus, but being kind of the being the being of lack not assuming this lack. And this is not necessarily an inferior position in the sense of saying, okay, now I'm lacking, but precisely saying, I am, I give being to this lack. I am, I did, with me, this thing exists and this can also be a source of power to some other kind of power. I mean, power, or uh, it's not simply, but it's, uh, it's a different way. So, okay, I complicate things a lot, but this was just to, uh, to say uh, that in a way, there is for for Lacan, there is one signifier for both or for all sexes that signifies the desire, the, the, the uh, and not that we all desire. It is not; it's the signifier of the lack of being, of the lack of uh, signified, of a signifier of castration. As he also, so the way he, the, we relate it and the way we use it as a something that we have and we can, uh, you know. Whip around or or or, or in some or dialecticize it in some other way is what kind of um, results in this what we see as different sexual positions. 
but it is not that uh, this, uh, and so in a way they are the results of this uh, handling of the symbolic impasses and structures and not uh, something that because we are born men or women, we behave in this or that way. No? So, uh, so it's always a kind of a um, chicken and egg situation that we have to be careful about not to say, okay, so we could, if, we, if we say there is no man, okay, we can say there is no man. It's not, the point is not that uh, it is men and not, uh, it, it, I don't think this would even change much. I mean, and I know that there were kind of possibilities to um, attempt to kind of symbolically affirm it, say, of course, but if this is a uh, failure, we should propose another feminine signifier uterus or whatever. So now we have, and we, I mean, obviously it doesn't work this way, but also pre precisely because phallus is not something that men inherently have. Uh, but something that they appropriate as a tool. And you know that there is this interesting in um, desire and its interpretation. Lacan quotes uh, a, a passage from Hamlet uh, where there is this exchange, I think, between Hamlet and perhaps uh, uh, somebody else. And it says the uh, it's, it goes like this: um, the king is but a thing, and the other person asks, a thing, my lord. A thing of nothing, and it also uh, and it, it it even starts like this: uh, body is with the king, but king is not with the body. King is the thing, the thing of nothing, something like this. And uh, I think uh, and Lacan relates this again to to this question of, of phallus as signifier, and we can precisely uh, paraphrase this by saying, you know. Uh, Phallus is with the body, but the body is not with the phallus. It's not, or the other way around. It is not precisely simply anatomy. It is the thing of nothing that we kind of use as a signifier of the lack of being, which is uh, universal. I mean, this is not that um, men lack nothing, women lack. It is precisely as human beings, we are beings of lack. But the way we symbolize this lack, uh, how it functions in all these realms of desire, sexuality, and so on, is different. It has many ways of being handled. I don't know if it... that, that makes sense to me. Uh, one question I, I had for you to change the the topic very slightly. Uh, something that I I work as a therapist, and so I, I use a lot of Lacanian and. Freudian theory and understanding to inform how I practice. And I also consider myself a, a feminist. And so I want to engage with patients in a way that is feminist. And I, I was wondering what your thoughts are on, would you consider Lacan and Freud to be feminist thinkers or would Lacanian and Freudian theory to be feminist? Um, yeah, I think um, in any case, one thing that can be said for sure is that they were both absolutely crucial for feminism. I mean, they, if they would describe themselves as feminist, I, I guess Lacan even did at some point, uh, whatever you can say, okay, this is um, whatever he meant by it or is ironic. I mean, they were, I think, absolutely crucial for, for feminism, for feminist theory, and also for the, the movement, the political movement itself perhaps not directly, but precisely because through them, all these questions uh, for the first time were articulated, uh, not only as questions, but also uh, were articulated in a way that one can discuss, one could discuss them, uh, name them, say something about them. And then there is also the simple fact, okay, Freud was the among the first that actually gave women the word. They were, I mean, like let's say the the, the the first patients, the the hysterics, they were he actually listened to them. This was not uh, this was very different from simply trying to uh, reduce their patho their pathology because immediately Freud saw that what was there on the couch with these women, hysterics and so on, was the society, was the family, not simply some kind of uh, pathological aberration that. Uh, Okay, then how women should relate to this society is another question. But immediately there was this connection. No, this is an objective problem. It's not simply a subjective problem. It's an objective problem. And this is why I, I also have this kind of a, a, a play, word play, that I like to repeat lately, uh, that, you know, th these days, uh, hysteria is referred to as, uh, I think, conversion disorder. 
And I think that this is a really a complete misnamer that if anything, hysteria is a conversion of disorder of social familial disorder into a bodily symptom. And as such, it, it uh, keeps a certain objective validity, even if it is highly fantasized subjectively, but it, it, there is a link to, to something. So th there is this fact, then there is the fact that Freud, I mean, there was never any question for Freud if women could practice analysis. And this was at times when women were prevented uh, from doing many, 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 most of the things actually that were. Uh, so, it, and this was not, not for a moment was this uh, a question. So there is something, I guess, even inherently, okay, what we would say uh, a feminist in this, that uh, whatever, was said about the difference and so on. This difference was never viewed as something um, that uh, would be impediment of women, something that would make them uh, enable or less able or whatever to do this or this or this. So uh, the the difference that for for Freud was never this kind of uh, uh, of difference. Then women should I don't know do this rather than uh, that. And so, uh, and I guess we can also judge, I mean, the, there was this feminist movement, uh, I mean, some of these early feminists, uh, early, I mean, the, the feminists that started to really use uh, psychoanalysis in this theory are still around, like Jacqueline Rose and so on. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, this is the, the whole MF journal in, in, uh, in the UK, uh, what, uh, what was extremely, informed precisely or was an attempt to uh, claim also the, to appropriate uh, the, the most interesting and important claims of psychoanalysis for feminism and not simply saying, okay, because <clears throat> these are these specious uh, terms sometimes that Freud used and so on, uh, we should be make is our enemy. And But mostly I really think that um, even these things as, you know, we, we talk about, um, I don't know, phallocentrism. I mean, the term itself would make absolutely no sense if there were no true psychoanalytic theory of uh, of the phallic. Of, uh, it, so it's not uh, something that uh, the, the vocabulary that also as feminists, even if we use it against <laughs> psychoanalysis, uh, 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 use is very much grow out of these interrogations. So these very serious interrogations of uh, sexuality, of uh, sexual difference, and what this sexual thing difference implies and what it does not imply. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that uh, uh, at least uh, uh, for me, there is this very important thing that uh, goes and it, it is much more important and much more far reaching uh, than, yes, uh, some of the statements that particularly um, Freud made that might sound as kind of a, um, whatever. Yeah. Patriarchal mm -hmm. or anti feminist or whatever. I think one thing in what you said that I think is really important to highlight is how crucial they were to feminism and in creating a language that feminism could yeah, use yeah. as a conceptual toolkit uh, mm -hmm. to pose a critique of patriarchy and of mm -hmm. uh, you know the phallocentrism of Western imperial society. Precisely, because this is not, and I think I I developed this more in detail in the comedy book, but uh, uh, I think when Lacan named this thing, phallus, it was precisely uh, to, to name something which was traditionally reserved for mysteries, you know, the, the, the phallic logic has been there for centuries, uh, but nobody named it as such. In the, and the moment it was named as such, that pinned to this, uh, very at the same time, you know, very uh, symbolic and also related to to a certain organ. Uh, it it uh, actually got deflated and not inflated. So uh, this is why I think that this criticism of Lacan that that, that oh he's name it false. No, he didn't name it false. He he named what was there, 
uh, with the name that it deserved. And it made it possible, as you just also said, to precisely relate to this, discuss it, criticize it, expose it in all kinds of ways. Uh, but uh, whereas before it was, the phallus was preserved for mysteries. It was always the thing behind the veil of all this uh, uh, patriarchal, um, not only rituals but also uh, structures so it was not it was so in a way like kind of exposing it or pinning him down also to this kind of ridiculous organ if you want at the end but at the same time showing why precisely uh and this kind of uh, uh the, the highest mysteries are related to this and how this corresponds to in to certain things in human uh desire, unconscious, and so on. This was the real revolution, I think, precisely uh, toward a possible um, yeah, feminist or a, a critique of uh, of all these uh, things. Yeah, I, I've always found it interesting that psychoanalysis has been the object of many accusations of, of many isms, misogynism, uh, misogyny, or, or uh, even uh, racism yeah. at times. Uh, where, as you know, uh, thinkers such as yourself and, and other psychoanalysts completely flip that narrative and instead find the, the absolute radicality in in presenting these very prickly subjects that that people sometimes misinterpret as uh, as as psychoanalysis supporting in some way, you know, or or, uh, or sustaining. Uh, but then this gets us to our last question, which is, what are the political inter implications of of Lacan's theory of sexuation, or where lies the radicality of Lacan's theory for, for feminism? And I think we, as we've been talking, we've been mentioning his reliance on the real and and how that is in, in a way uh, different and, and radical. But if you can give, yeah, your explanation of, of exactly what is uh, perhaps a political project or how can Lacan's theory of sexuation be translated into politics? Yeah, I'm not sure that there is a there could be a direct translation, and I think for me um, the political dimension of the properly political dimension of psychoanalysis does not simply uh, lie in some of its um, uh, direct political claims or whatever things that, that but that there is something about uh, psychoanalysis that could be seen as inherently political, even when it doesn't discuss or talk politics. So um, obviously there is this idea of um, what we would um, emphatically call um, uh, emancipation of, of a certain or a certain idea of freedom, which of course it's not simply the opposite of necessity. You know, these are complex questions, but nevertheless, um, psychoanalysis does work with something which would enable the subject also in terms of, uh, of clinics uh, to kind of um, start again uh, at the point of some impasse uh, that had kind of uh, started to really block the the possible uh, subjectivity, the possible uh, ways of of living in 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 a, not simply pleasant, but in a good way of the sense that uh, one makes things or create things that are meaningful for them and for for uh, others perhaps. So there is this uh, thing which is not uh, so direct translation of, uh, I mean, pr the problem is one problem, big problem also discussed now among many psychoanalytics on the on the left that do want to combine this with politics is the question of the organization, you know. That, uh, Gabriel Tupinamba published this book on, on desire of psychoanalysis, where he kind of questions precisely the way in which psychoanalytic movement, Lacanian movements, were able or unable to come up with something like an organization. And it was just followed this part of the solutions of this or that, which um, kind of politically resonates uh, in um 
not necessarily best way. So if the, the, if there is just dissolution of uh, of all organizations, so uh, th th this is a serious problem, and I don't think one can address it uh, just like uh, uh, or in the by the way manner. But uh, I think that um, uh, there is one thing that already, according to Alcicer, kind of put psychoanalysis in a similar position than, for instance, Marxism or Marxist theory uh, was this idea that uh, it was never about some kind of a neutral perspective on society or on whatever, that it, it was as such part of the antagonisms that it analyzed and um, talked about and so on. So that there is no objective pers uh, or, or neutral perspective or that neutral perspective is necessarily uh, repressive precisely of the things that are the most interesting so that you can only be partial to really be uh, on the right side so to say that it, it is to be part to be partial is to be objective in a way and this this rhymes with political struggle and it rhymes with the certain dispositions in, of, of the unconscious. It is not uh, to neutralize things, but to insist, to, to through these partial things that kind of uh, uh, distort, you could say, the, uh, the individual or subjective, whatever space, that, uh, that can, uh, a true breakthrough could be achieved. This is another point. And then I think there is also, perhaps this could be related to what we were discussing, what I was saying earlier about uh, uh, this uh, in, in, inter, uh, intrinsic divide, namely, again, a huge debate about possible concepts of the universal. Universality, as you know, has a very bad reputation. But if we are serious with politics, we should we cannot simply dismiss it as something which is we should not at all um, think or talk in universal terms because this is necessarily colored by this or that um, partial power and so on. Uh, yes, but this is precisely why uh, perhaps we should think about different notions of the universal. And, and I think here uh, psychoanalysis, can, uh, psychoanalysis can indeed help because uh, the, the, the notion of the universal that for me kind of uh, springs from psychoanalysis is not that of a kind of a common hat or um, heading that we can put on a, um, across as many people as possible, like uh, englobe the, the, the last majority or so kind. So now this is uh, universal, uh, not, uh, not something like this, um, uh, but uh, uh, rather as a certain divide, a certain antagonism shared by all. You know, that the kind of a thread that goes through most of us, uh, but that also necessitated it, but it's not in itself will not unite us, but it uh, it could unite us only if we make a certain type of decisions based on this kind of antagonism. If we take certain sides, if we so there is a thread that can constitute a certain kind of universality uh, along many, many kind of struggles, uh, which is not this kind of uh, overheading, uh, whatever entity that um, overall entity that would unite us, but precisely uh, as a singular point that nevertheless, not only unites us as this singular point, but also, as I said, because there are certain, yeah, also political, subjective, uh, so the decisions that we make or do not make uh, in relationship to this divide, that this divide becomes apparent. You cannot ignore it. I think once you're in analysis, if anything, you uh, you cannot ignore this kind of uh, split or divide that uh, makes you. Uh, and then you do something with it or not. But um, so, yeah, this perhaps can be, an, it's an abstract way of putting it, but uh, the, the notion of a different kind of universality from the one that rhymes with this more imperialist, whatever, universality or that imposes a certain very uh, local or particular notions as universal to everybody, uh, there is an alternative to this, perhaps uh, 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 another, and uh, yeah, but uh, again, I at the same time, I don't think that there there is kind of a possible direct translation of um, psychoanalytic or formulation of political project of psychoanalysis, or perhaps there is one, and perhaps you have some idea of it. I have, 
I, I, I don't know. Well, I, that I, you, you go first, Tyler. No, I was just going to bring up your, your concept. Uh, I don't think it was, yeah, towards the end of the book of, of a new signifier, uh, the signifier, which, yeah. which uh, emerges from uh, directly from this, this constitutive lack and and wondering if you can if you can speak on that a little bit but i don't know if you had anything related to that nick actually yeah i had it's very funny i had the exact same thing mm -hmm. that i yeah. think part of the the radical project of psychoanalysis is naming this universal contradiction that's animating aspects of society um in the way that marx named the class contradiction um mm -hmm. as, a, as an animating contradiction uh and our project and, is very much yeah the same. yeah no, I have to say that this is yeah the, the very the concluding part of the book. I'm not saying that uh, I, I think there are many more things that should be said there or even put in question in relationship to this. I don't uh, cling on to this as a kind of my final word about uh, psychoanalysis and, and politics. Because at the same, uh, at, on the one hand, uh, and it was uh, the, the example for, for Marx was not simply uh, meant as an example because I, I think that this naming of the class struggle is still pertinent, but at the same time, perhaps not. not miss, I, I I think it is still there, class struggle, obviously, but um, that it is it exists and its visibility is less obvious than in this kind of classical forms of factories and you know this iconography of working class. It's uh, so it's not that it's no longer than 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 now it is something else that psychoanalysis needs to to name. I I, I think it's very much. Uh, uh, on this uh, social level, absolutely the, the the right diagnosis, but perhaps it needs uh, not only uh, a name or something that kind of more directly related um, to, uh, let's say, the the the, the struggle of, of the, the proletariat or the people or whatever in the, which are deep shit who don't relate to it, who don't recognize in this something. No, so uh, in this sense, you have to, as Lacan puts it, you have to find the work that works, not that you just uh, invent it, but something that people kind of take as, okay, this is the right, you know, um, uh, uh, something that starts to shift things or that, um, so, uh, and this is obviously the problem now. If you look like socially now, we, we shifted, let's say, to, to politics in the sense of like social um, politics. It is obvious that uh, the more we are uh, moving in this kind of rather, rather disastrous mode of capitalism in which even capitalism itself no longer uh, is already in panic and no, no longer thinks that it can itself kind of uh, more or less um, uh, amorphize or, or, or uh, this crisis is that this is itself producing, the, that it could function as its step, their stabilizer, as it did for a long time, even if at the huge cost. Uh, but still, there was this idea, you know, that um, capitalism needs crises uh, in order to kind of... Uh, become stronger through them, to reinvent it, after them, and also this way kind of stabilize, stabilizes the social space. But now I don't think this is any longer the case, and this crisis is produced mostly by capitalism, this mode of production actually are no longer even something that capitalism itself can really must, um, uh, stabilize, it can still use them and profit from them in this or that way. But so there is a certain kind of um, of panic or of a certain kind of uncertainty that uh, that comes uh, that is felt here and but uh, the, the the point sorry I, this was a too long digression but I think what I wanted to say is that uh, people who are usually associated with this kind of class position let's say do not uh, uh, are not mostly at least uh, going for supporting voting and kind of uh, left ideas of this or that, but on the contrary, recognize uh, more in figures on the right, even extreme right, as something, someone that, who, that understands and names their problem and so on. So there is a lot to be said and done in relationship to uh, to this question, precisely who, uh, why are these names, which are false names, I would say, the, the 
the name is the, the right that Altright offers to people. That there is something true, but then at the same time in the diagnosis, but at the same time there is something completely false, also completely um, imaginarily uh, worked over this truth, and then um, uh, turned into this kind of what we call whatever authoritarian populism and stuff. So the question of uh, of naming things and of um, articulating problems in a way that people can relate to, but also in the long term, not just to provide them with a scapegoat, which is, okay, then it's the fault of me, immigrants or of this or that, this obviously it's the easiest way, but is um, it's part of, yeah, how what politics and particularly precisely emancipatory or left or whatever uh, politics should also uh, be working uh, on or thinking about and um, but yeah yeah it's a, it's a great what, what, I, what i hear you saying is that you know we need to organize around these you know animating contradictions and um that the right oftentimes i think operates on this logic of disavowal of, of papering over yeah, these yeah. contradictions and providing answers, you know, the, the right has a very concrete answer to the question of what is sex. Very concrete. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. What is black yeah, and white? Said, mm. It also uh, reminds me of uh, Todd McGowan's uh, distinction between a politics of belonging and, and non-belonging. And the, the politics of belonging, like Nick was saying, and like you were saying, they have very clear answers, to, in a sense, a very easy uh means of conducting politics you know uh in, in a very uh, i guess comfortable way but what i also hear you saying is um a uh, universal in the sense of uh, cultivating a, a universal non-belonging a uh, universal kind of uh, gap that, that we're all uh experiencing same time, I mean, uh, I'm not simply into this kind of negative uh, uh, ontology or theology. Uh, I'm not saying that it is only this lack that unites them. I think this lack or this gap assumes a very concrete forms of negative, or very concrete forms of discrimination, of this or that uh, uh, injustice, wrong, and so on. And that these concrete forms uh, and that this common thread of antagonism that uh, um, kind of result in these um, discriminations, in these forms of injustices, uh, should be something that helps us see, also unite along these divides, these kind of concrete struggles, uh, ex um, instead of kind of um, putting us uh, uh, one against the other, you know, like, no, we are women, uh, if feminists now cannot be the same, this is not the same struggle as the LGBT struggle, this is not the same struggle, even, you know, within the, this uh, small portion, let's say, of what we discuss, like cultural sexualities and so on, there is already this phenomena of uh, kind of... Uh, infinite decisions taking place within this, uh, this all these concrete struggles uh, see themselves as not only different from each other, but also as kind of uh, directly antagonistic. And so uh, there is something that I think would uh, also need to happen in this space of antagonism uh, that would perhaps uh, um, go more in the direction of uh, aligning this concrete struggle, not simply, I mean, yeah, the, the, uh, I'm not simply saying, okay, negativity should unite us, yes, of course, but this negativity always takes a concrete positive form in the social, it's not simply some, uh, so, and we have to be able to perceive these concrete struggles as also our struggles. When they are, I mean, this is what is, and also uh, to kind of relate this our struggles to other struggles and broader struggles uh, and so on. So, but um, this is, yeah, something that would need to happen transnationally. Trans, it's a, a different kind of globalism, if you want, not the one that we ended up with, but something that nevertheless is not, uh, uh, but the, because what we are seeing is um, on the contrary, this uh, infinite fragmentation of um, radicalization, but fragmentation of uh, uh, of these struggles and uh, claims. And, uh, and this is not uh, something that, whereas we need something that would kind of, uh, uh, yeah, relate them in a more uh, and make them appear together as it 
happens from time to time. I mean, it's uh, but but it's not. I mean, for instance, I I heard it, heard it uh, at some point. This did happen in Iran with this protest because it, this was not perceived simply as feminist struggle. It was perceived as kind of uh, also worker struggle. I mean, it uh, kind it was uh, able to at least it seems uh, without necessarily. Uh, um, much uh, so far uh, um, uh, uh, political uh, effect, but nevertheless uh, able to mobilize people um, against these divides as precisely something that uh, nevertheless um, uh, is the repetition perhaps or uh, form of the of the same divide that they should be able to uh, struggle with and for together. But okay, these are all abstract. Uh, oh, no, what should be how we should? I mean, this is the the impossible. I mean, I hate this. Uh, we should do this. We should step. I don't know. This uh, we should ban perhaps this even this vocabulary. What we should do prescription. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I have no direct recipes in this sense. Neither do we. <laughs> but uh, were you going to say something, Nick? Um. Yes, but I think that's, that's probably a, a good place to end it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, was this was uh, long. I hope it. Uh, yeah. You no, 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 that was perfect. Well, we'll 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 uh, certainly send it to you once it's uh, once it's ready. And um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on. It was, it was yeah. a pleasure. Thank you. No, it was great pleasure meeting you, and uh, I'm sure we'll we'll keep in touch. Take care. Bye. Take care. Ciao.